Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education meeting here on Monday, July 12th, 2021 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchek. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over to my right. Uh, as we are no longer we no longer have limits on in-person attendance, we will not be taking remote comments. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment tonight. As we always do, let's start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> All right, listed on tonight's agenda are 25 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? All right. And we'll go straight to our reports to the board. We'll kick it off with the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. So in lieu of my uh, normal superintendent's report, I will submit the uh, various departmental reports in writing, um, and they'll be included in the uh, board update for the community. I did want to just take some time and update the community on the learning model for the fall. So this past Friday afternoon, school districts in Illinois received guidance for this fall from the CDC, IDPH, and State Board of Education. We received this guidance at the same time as the public, so there was no way to plan ahead to provide immediate answers. A clarifying statement was issued by the State Board of Education on Saturday afternoon regarding masks. Unfortunately, the guidance and the clarifier received leaves more questions than answers due to contradictory language. For example, here is an example of that language from the State Board. The CDC recommends schools maintain at least three feet of physical distance between students within classrooms combined with indoor mask wearing by people who are not fully vaccinated to reduce transmission risk. When it is not possible to maintain a physical distance of at least three feet, such as when schools cannot fully reopen while maintaining these distances, it is especially important to layer multiple other preventative strategies, such as indoor masking. So in the first part of the sentence, they seem to indicate everyone needs to wear a mask if they're not vaccinated. In the second half of the sentence, they seem to indicate if you can't keep social distancing, you should wear a mask. And so those are big questions that we need to have answered. My team and I will spend the next several days and weeks working with the Illinois State Board of Education, the IDPH, the DuPage County Health Department, and neighboring districts to gather more information. While I wish I could give our community all the answers that are being sought, it's still too early to provide concrete answers in terms of what will take place. Having said all of that, my goal has always been to find a way to recommend to the board the most normal school experience for our students. This means that I very much want to see school return in a similar manner to where it was prior to the pandemic. This could mean optional mask wearing with common sense restrictions. However, I'm not yet able to make that recommendation as there's a great deal of information that is forthcoming that needs to be sorted through. As an example, the CDC's language states should wear a mask. We need guidance as to whether this means must or if families can have their choice. Therefore, we will continue to work with these questions with our legal counsel and insurance providers. I will communicate with our community as this is an evolving situation. The district needs more time to gather accurate information. We will provide clarity as soon as possible and I wanna thank everyone in advance for their patience as we sort through this. The good news is though, in terms of this guidance, there are more questions answered uh, than what we had last summer. So I know some of this seems like a repeat. So one big change that is welcome news is instead of six feet of social distance, it is now three feet, and that includes lunch. That opens up a lot of those common spaces that we had to commandeer last year in order to make instruction happen. Um, quarantine requirements also fall under that three feet, not six feet, so that's a line. The one area where students will have to wear masks at all times, and this is um, a mandate, is on public transportation or our school buses. So school buses kids have to wear a mask, we know that. The rest is very, very great. We are anticipating that the State Board of Education will release an FAQ 
which for those of you who have been on the board or, or you know paying attention throughout this pandemic, those are very helpful. Um, there's a rumor that it could be out of Wednesday. We're anticipating it sometime this week. As soon as we get that FAQ, we'll work with all of our partner districts to go through. But you know these FAQs can be very lengthy and, and we need a lot of time to go through each and every one of them. So more to come on this in the coming weeks, but I don't want anyone in the community to think that there'll be an announcement on Friday or even on Monday of what it's going to look like because it is gonna take some time to sort through. Having said that, I do recognize that families wanna know right away and so we wanna make sure that we give them the information that they're requesting, but it's important that we get them the right information with the correct answer, not just a quick answer. And so that is something that um, we're working through. But in terms of positive signs, um, this guidance is much more flexible. And the other big emphasis on this guidance is that social distancing should not be a hindrance to getting all kids in school every single day of the week. Of course, we were already there as a school district, but if you can't do three feet, they're still saying get the kids in school and then you just have to you know, continue to find layers of mitigation. So we will continue to work through that. We're working with our partner districts, um, but a lot more to come on that because that is obviously one of the biggest things we'll be tackling over the next few weeks. Questions? Okay. I know we're all anxious to, yeah. to, to get more information and get a little bit more clarity. So, And thank you to the board. I know that this came out on Friday afternoon and clarifiers, I know I was communicating with you all weekend, so thank you for that. Thank you. All right. That brings us up to the monthly business and the treasurer's report. So welcome up to the podium, Todd Drayfall. <clears throat> Since it's uh, summer and it's uh, for us construction or uh, capital work season, I'm going to start off with uh, letting Kevin Bardo come up and kind of give the board a quick update on uh, where we're at with construction and and updates for buildings uh, through the summer. Good evening, everyone. Um, quick construction updates. So work is progressing well around the district. Um, all projects are active and we're moving custodial staff as needed um, to accommodate the contractor schedules and the work areas. So with the Highland, uh, first project, Highland Playground renovation, Final details are falling in place for the build days towards the end of this month. Uh, White & Company has been very helpful in modifying sketches and drawings uh, multiple times as we, as we uh, tweak that final layout. The demolition by the contractor should begin this week for that Highland Playground. The floor tile at three O'Neill classrooms in Henry Puffer basement, the old floor tile uh, abatement has been finished um, and the new flooring installation has begun. Another project over at Fairmount, some miscellaneous mechanical equipment. Uh, the workers have been on site again today, and it's, um, while it's nice to have them there, we do have some concerns there about the overall construction schedule, um, basically based on the lead times for the new equipment. So the marketplace uh, is a little longer on lead times than we'd like to see, so White & Company is trying to get more information um, on that uh, equipment topic and any alternatives that um, may present or, or mitigate the delay. The largest project, the Pierce Downer Roof, the masonry contractor uh, continues to work on the exterior joints and brick replacements. And the interior and exterior chimney has been removed. The boiler room has uh, been cleaned up. The roofing contractor has started working Saturdays to try to make up some time. Um, they've made progress on the west end of the building and they're working each day, obviously, as weather allows. The Pierce Downer mechanical equipment is in great shape. The demolition is finished. The major components of the boiler room, such as boilers, pumps, and tanks are on site. They've been uh, installed with the, through the, uh, the wall of the building. They're ready to be hooked up, and so they're gonna be back here at the end of the week for that. The Kingsley server room is on track. Uh, the interior electrical work is complete. We are waiting for the generator to be delivered, um, which will be here in mid-August. And the final one for an update is the Henry Puffer uh, playground pavement and the Herrick parking lot pavement. So the asphalt has been removed at both locations there and weather permitting excavation and grading will occur at Puffer this week with new asphalt to follow next week at both locations. Any questions on construction? 
Kevin, the uh, project that you said was delayed, what's the worst case scenario with the, that project and the building being able to reopen? So the one, one we're looking at as an alternative to the equipment that was specified is maybe there's a model that's out there um, that is more available. And so White and Company engineers are looking at that to see if that could you know, make us up some time. But still, from an engineering standpoint, you know, be acceptable to the uh, design of the project. Got it. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is the uh, year-to-date report. This is the uh, first report. This is the report for the end of the fiscal year from fiscal year 21 uh, as of June 30th. Um, what you have in the packet is a, is a cash uh, I should say it's a cash basis however understand that the salaries for teachers on the teacher contract uh, for July and August are paid out into that piece so those any accruals and all those are covered uh, by the June 30th list what is not in there is uh, some revenue that we have to come in uh, there are two pieces and we added uh, to this report specifically a kind of a paragraph explaining uh, some of the the differentials um, and a little green bar if you look on your graph there's a green uh, section added this month that includes uh, two pieces of revenue to come in one uh, DuPage County in restructuring a bit or adjusting um, had only two distributions before June 30th the third distribution of property taxes came in July 9th that put us below the 50% um, of the tax levy that we use that we use as budgeted for fiscal year 21 so we're just under that so we have six hundred and sixty five thousand dollars to go back that came in in July that will go back in the audit uh, that's counted against fiscal year 21. Additionally, $835,000 of ESSER II money. Um, we have been working diligently with the state at updating the grants to get everything approved. Uh, the state has been working through what are changes, uh, it seems, on a frequent basis as to uh, what's covered how to cover how to budget how to how to allocate uh, for those funds and so those are for expenses that we've incurred for the last year due to uh, COVID and the pandemic uh, that are eligible under ESSER um, we had hoped that we would get through the approval process and that the distribution would happen so that it would kind of clean itself up uh, that didn't uh, we will we will receive those over the summer uh, as part of the audit process with that modified accrual obviously those revenues um, are, are then accounted for in fiscal year 21 so once that is all done uh, we are in a positive position for year-end which is where we expect it to be uh, it's just a matter of the timing of those two revenues so we wanted to show you where we were in a cash position um, as of to June 30th effectively but also then show you uh, what it will look like or what will be closer to it once we have um, those things closed out and the audit comes in. There will probably be some additional revenues and so forth that will go back and forth uh, into that process um, as it happens every year with the accruals. Uh, title money, there will be some title money comes in in August that gets screwed back as well. So, uh, but overall we're in a good position uh, remembering uh, the fact that when the board approved uh, a budget last September 2000 we were about 1.6 million negative um, between the federal funds that came in that we <coughs> didn't know 12 months ago uh, as well as the lower transportation piece and as well as some significant controlling and, and maintaining and watching our expenditures we were able to uh, to come in within you know with a balanced position uh, with revenue over expenses once all all is done um, I'll point out one other anomaly real quick. Uh, the medical reserve fund ended up almost exactly within $454, $55 of where it started the fiscal year. 
um, and that's with a decrease for some of the a decrease in rates for the HSA fund in January and a, and a zero increase uh, with the other um, uh, program plans in that health and health insurance piece we don't expect that we'll be able to maintain that uh, for the next open enrollment we'll probably have to see some increase uh, and that will come to the board in October for open enrollment uh, in November other than that if there are questions on the year-to-date report wonderful Last piece of the uh, monthly business report I wanted to bring up and, and review. Um, the board was uh, had posted out a bid for the sale of Longfellow uh, and opened it in the end of June. Uh, we had a bid, but not a bid that met the minimum um, for the for that was set by the board. As such, we could not accept that that bid. Um, wanted to review just a few pieces um, of the reasons and looking at where we're at with Longfellow and, and covering some of the ownerships of liability um, because some I understand have asked about you know how does this impact budget uh, for this year and going forward from a liability and ownership standpoint obviously we you know we, what what we maintain and own has a cost to it uh, we know that the cost of ownership that we've established for Longfellow is 117,000 uh, accruing up and going through what we need to do to maintain the building and start to invest in the building. That doesn't include the, uh, and Kevin was able to, Kevin Bart was able to pull up the last, uh, this last year's $15,000 in cleaning costs and uh, additional $7,800 in snow removal for that property. So that adds another 228 into that piece. We also know that, and the board is well aware of this, uh, that there is, you know, the fire alarm system, uh, if it fails, is a $75,000 replacement. Um, we continually also point out that, you know, the boilers have a $200,000 cost to it if we had to replace them if they were unrepairable. The budget impact uh, on this is, um, and, and we have stated throughout the process that the sale of Longfellow and the proceeds do not have an operational impact. In fact, we've been very, we have recommended to the board that any of those, that those proceeds be used for capital improvements um, for schools in the district. Uh, Kevin has given you an update on the, uh, this year's work. Uh, that is from, majority of that work is from $3 million bond issuance uh, that the board authorized in March, um, February, and half of that is for the roof at Pierce Downer. Um, we have over $100 million of deferred maintenance, and we have to continually work towards uh, finding funds to do that. Uh, obviously, the, pro you know, the proceeds were to go for that, for that piece. So on a budget standpoint, at this point, we have no impact. Um, if we continue on with the process, review and reflect and, and, and make adjustment, um, those proceeds <coughs> would be able to come in in time for us to look at the next aspect of putting out bids in December and January for the next summer's work in summer of 22 for some additional updates, um, you know, for updating some of the higher priority, the next list of priority items uh, that we certainly were not able to do this year. <clears throat> so some of the things in reviewing um, the, the bid and the results of the bid and, and, and uh, the one we received and, and talking to uh, one of the developers, um, and we came to have some understanding of this aspect in this process. Uh, first off, we want to make sure that you know, understand our goal is always to make sure we don't undervalue a district asset. Um, in doing so, you know, we, evaluation was established um, 
that valuation under the market was not met. So in reviewing that piece and, and talking to um, both looking at the bid that we did receive and, and another um, potential bidder, we come to understand uh, some of their, what, how they were looking at it. One is that unknown asbestos abatement time frame, or, or I'm sorry, asbestos abatement cost. That's something we're going to work on. Uh, and we're working with our vendor to find out what they think that might be so that it's something we could provide in the future. Um, an estimated removal of, of Longfellow being uh, in that five hundred to six hundred thousand dollar range. Uh, additionally, one of the items stressed was uh, in the bid that was uh, put out was that the district would be had a six month time frame to move out of the building um, so that we had time to lease space retrofit ASC and then move staff out of um, out of Longfellow into ASC. That retrofit of ASC is an eight eight plus week build time. Um, leasing has some limits as far as us being able to structure move. Obviously earlier on was about moving during a time we could not move when we were opening schools. So looking at that six month delay piece for developers looking to finance and them not having access to the property was also uh, a concern of theirs. Taking all of that into, into place, we look at what we would do for a next step in moving forward and in establishing and coming back with a new resolution in August with a lower sale price and addressing those those items uh, that have been demonstrated. One, we're working with um, our asbestos abatement firm to develop uh, and to get a strong number as to what that abatement cost might be. Um, looking at ways at how we can reduce the time frame that we would be in the building upon closing. There is some adjustment now because we don't have, we didn't have August and part of September as an automatic delay piece because we, we couldn't move uh, administration. Um, but there's also a piece that we're able, by looking at uh, doing some things, moving the process forward, um, allowing for access to the property. Uh, there are four developer lots that do not impact um, <coughs> flow in and out of the building for maintenance and technology staff that would be in that building during that time while we are retrofitting ASC. So those could be turned over uh, in an earlier stage uh, for access for a developer to start to do whatever it is they want to do with those, market them, develop them, um, you know, start that process. Uh, we also would, and then looking at the August meeting, look to lease office space to start that calendar uh, and to start to move in that direction, uh, move any, approve any of the agreements uh, that would be needed for that. We specifically talk about the AT&T contract that we need to uh, enlist and move <coughs> to get internet and access, uh, move to that leased space, and then approve the bid of renovation for ASC, uh, those bids were just open this last week. Uh, it was seven, eight bidders, I believe, uh, that we had response. We had a huge response in bidders, um, and so, and and several in the and right within a few thousand dollars of each other. So it was a really good bid process, um, and that would allow us to start that collection that the, the bidder to order materials, uh, some of those things that have longer lead times so that we didn't have the example that Kevin just gave of waiting for some equipment to come in uh, as we're working. You know, we, we start that calendar uh, right off the bat. So those would be uh, the next steps in moving forward if the board chose to go this route, um, you know, is to come back at the August meeting. Questions on that? Questions, comments? I have a question, and um, 
it's going to reveal a, a complete um, lack of understanding of the construction industry um, on, my, on my part. Um, so I, I understand what you're saying about the six month delay and um, them not having access to the property and that you know, when they borrow the money and they're not going to have any chance to start developing the property for six months. I, I, I understand that that deterred some, some people who are potentially going to bid on the property. Um, if, we, if we take some action on this at a future board meeting, that sets the 60 day clock started again. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't possibly be taking any action on a final sale until October at the earliest. Correct. Is that an the optimal time to be <clears throat> a, a developer picking up? I mean, when you start looking at the, the coming winter months, is that are we going to run into the same problem with that timetable, potentially? Um, I, I that is a question I would have to. I mean, well, so there's t there's two pieces to the. I'll give you the two two answers or. or one, the 60 days, we don't necessarily, I mean, we have pushed out to the 60 days to give people maximum amount of time to do their due diligence mm -hmm. and research. The board is capped at the 60 days. Okay. You could do a shorter window. I don't know as if we'd want to recommend it because we want to make sure as many people did right. as much due diligence as possible to, you know, uh, because obviously we're trying, you know, we would like as many possible bidders as, as, as uh, you know, to come in. Um, I don't know if it will have an impact on that piece. I think there's p things that some can do. I think it depends on what they were going to do. If they're going to sure. sell off a portion, if they're going to market it and sell off to someone who's going to just build a house there. Uh, which I understand happens, um, or to other builders, um, or you know they're going to start, and you know I think it's a period of time before they can start doing work. Um, you know, it, it would probably set them up to be able to ready to start in the, you know when the thaw happens. Sure. But I think some days these days, depending on the winter, that doesn't that isn't so much an issue anymore. Anything else? Well, thank you, and thank, thank you. you for going back and doing all the uh, kind of post-mortem stuff. I know uh, uh, we really appreciate kind of the, the aggression that we, we took when we went out to that first one. I, I got to tell you, as we're starting to, to talk with people and looking at everything, your analysis from sitting on the FAC was, was really spot on. Um, and so uh, much, you know, much more accurate than I think than we were starting to get some hype up towards the end on what the real value was, but I, I stand by what you said and uh, in the past and what you said today is you don't want to leave anything out there, so I, I appreciate all that, that level of work and we look forward to this stuff uh, coming to us in the future. Thank you. All right, the policy committee did not meet in June, neither did the legislative committee or the FAC. Uh, nor did the district leadership team or the health and wellness committee. So that brings us on to our discussion item for the night, which is the e-learning discussion for school year 2021 through 2022. Welcome, Justin Sissel. Thank you. Uh, after our brief conversation at the last board meeting, we wanted to bring forth a, a, another brief presentation to just highlight some of the elements of the potential e-learning plan and some potential next steps for us both as a board and as an administrative team. And so just as a reminder, again, an e-learning day is something that is available to school districts who have an adopted resolution to be able to use in place of a traditional emergency day. So essentially, the same idea is present. It is an emergency day and school is not physically in session. However, rather than simply taking adding on a day at the end of the year, we could continue learning on that day through an e-learning platform. That proposal has to ensure that we can provide access to all students, that we can meet specific needs of all students and all categories of students, and also meet a set of criteria that we'll highlight briefly in the next slides. The first piece is that we have to meet and verify that we've met five clock hours of instruction. Now this would look very similar to what it looked like, I know we don't always want to remember quite this far back, but when we opened school in the fall in a fully remote platform, the structure of those days would look very similar to what the structure of, these, of, a, of an e-learning day could look like. It would be a combination of students synchrony, synchronously engaging via Zoom or some sort of video conferencing um, 
software. It would also be some asynchronous or independently act uh, completed activities with teacher check-in throughout the course of the day and based upon the grade level of the student we create those specific schedules and expectations for each student. At the middle school level it would look very similar to a middle school day with following uh, a set of that eight period day checking in with each teacher in the way that that teacher has set forth. Again always having that minimum amount of synchronous or connected uh, activity on one of those days. Another piece is to make sure that we, that all students would have access, and this is one of those things that we already do. Obviously, we, we have one-to-one -one devices in grades K-8. The idea behind the e-learning plan, though, is also that we would want to acknowledge that there may be families or situations in that moment where access could be limited, and so the idea of having some print material available at home and sent home kind of in advance as a, a backup packet, just so to speak, is also part of the provision of a plan. We also will continue to work every year as we certainly have over the past two to ensure that all District 58 families have access to digital communication and information. So that may mean in some cases that families are doing that via a phone, but then they would have the student device to, to be there, but at least that phone or that, that connection would be able to ensure access to the expectations and the material for an e-learning type of a day. We need to make sure that we are accommodating for the unique needs of all of our students. And so as we talk about the specific implementation of one of these days and what the tasks and activities would look like for students, our special education staff, our related services staff would be part of all of that planning. And certainly one of the things that we've talked about is that our students who have some of the most significant needs benefit most significantly from being on site, <coughs> from being in person. And yet there's also the reality that that continuity and consistency of the faces they're used to seeing and voices they're used to hearing on a given school day within some structure can also provide some of that sustained benefit. We need to make sure that students and staff are adequately trained. Obviously, the past uh, 15 months have given us a, a, a wealth of training in terms of working through uh, a, a distance learning platform. However, we want to make sure those skills don't completely rust if we were wanting to be able to access this. And so there would be an opportunity for students to practice what this could look like in school, just as we practice for many other emergency type situations. It wouldn't be a weekly type of practice, but to ensure that if called upon to access those skills, our students and our staff would be able to do it handily. The other piece that, um, is another piece that's required is notice, and that's, that's twofold. One piece of the notice is ensuring that 30 days prior to any use of an e-learning day, we notify all stakeholders of what that, um, what that day could look like, what the parameters of the day would be. And then upon enacting an actual e-learning day, ensuring that our notification systems are robust. And again, this is something where we're far out ahead of the requirements in terms of our ability to notify all of our stakeholders, all of our families and staff in, in various platforms platforms at a moment's notice. One thing to continue to remember as we talk about this is that the e-learning day is emergent by nature and so it would not be the continuous look of, you know, I made the reference to our remote learning plan last fall. There was a lot of very specific day-to-day -day continuity with that plan and the reality is that enacting an e-learning day would have to require some flexibility. There would be cases where the lesson could follow sequentially based upon the content and, and what the, the teacher and the students were familiar with. There will be places where it may look a little bit more like um, a, a desire of continuity of learning but not necessarily sequential learning. So at, at a given moment a teacher may have more of a drop-in type of lesson that is valuable and certainly focused on grade level standards and skills but may not be exactly sequential. <coughs> And the other piece that ties to that reminder is that all of these decisions are made on a case-by-case -case case basis. So the first question for Dr. Russell is, is it safe for students to be in school or to travel to and from school? And if the answer to that question is no, then the next question is, which is the better platform to use for that day, a traditional emergency day that would be made up in the, f in the spring, or an e-learning day that would allow for some continuity without making that day up? And as we discussed last month, there are a lot of factors that could go into that. That. You know, the, the, the difference between a snow day that is truly kind of safe at home but the road travel is, is treacherous in the morning where students could enjoy being outside and having some of those traditional snow day moments is different than the two or three day cold snaps we've experienced in the past where we really don't have a lot of other options than sitting inside in the heated spaces where some of that continuity of learning may become more beneficial than simply that traditional emergency day. And so our recommendation as an administrative team is that we move forward with the submission of this plan to ISB for their approval. 
the, the real reason being that it provides us with flexibility as we go forward. It doesn't require us to enact an e-learning day, but as we shared last month, the absence of an approved plan does not afford us the, the option to enact an e-learning day at any point during the school year. And again, even with that plan approved, as I just mentioned, it would continue to be a judicious day's use, excuse me, a judicious use of emergency days in general, as well as choosing the e-learning day over that traditional emergency day. And another component of the plan, and really of anything we do here as a, as a team, is to continue to solicit feedback. If we were to implement an e-learning day, we'd want to know pretty immediately how it went for families, how it went for students, how it went for staff. Was it something that could be seen as beneficial? Are there things we need to review? Um, that's part of an annual review of the plan, and frankly, whether or not we enact an actual day during the course of that year. And so tonight, there's no actual, there's no formal action. This is a discussion item tonight. But if we, the process moving forward then would be to share that draft plan with all of our association leadership to ensure they have an opportunity for feedback and questions. The requirements then would be at a board meeting, ostensibly the next board meeting, we would hold a brief public hearing, which would allow for any comment to be made on the plan prior to a board vote. Um, it, assuming then that we did have an action item and receive board approval, we would notify, um, well, prior to that, excuse me, we'd notify everyone about the hearing. And then after that, if it was approval, we would start to develop those really specific details about what implementation would look like. That would be ongoing in the first months of the school year, but that August approval would allow us some of that initial um, institute day time and staff planning time to really begin some of those conversations. So again, no action tonight. The idea would be that the, the public hearing and then the potential vote on the approval of the plan by the board so that that could be submitted to the state would happen in August and we would expect to hear back from the state somewhere in the next few weeks after that board meeting. So that's what I wanted to, to share this evening and I <coughs> wanted to now open it up for questions or discussion around the e-learning plan. Thanks Justin. Um, as always, uh, well thought out presentation and, and speaking on behalf of the board, we always appreciate all the hard work you and your team puts into this. Um, I was not at the June meeting. Um, I was out of town for personal reasons, so I could not attend. Uh, so I, I missed the, um, the opportunity to have the conversation um, in here with, with my fellow board members. Um, I guess to me, my, my initial reaction to this idea is this is a, uh, a solution in search of a problem. Um, I, 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 I had some takeaways from your presentation in terms of you know, the why behind this and um, you know, flexibility seems to be the, the biggest um, uh, criterion there or the biggest um, push for this. Um, so I, you know, maybe I'll understand a little bit more how, that, how that's beneficial for our kids and our families to have this flexibility. I guess my, you know, I was on the board two years ago when we dismissed this out of hand. Um, six of us were on that board. Um, and then in that t time period we've come back, we've actually had a lot of experience with um, remote learning since then. Um, for different reasons than, than snow days. Um, so I guess um, one thing I'd like to see uh, in the next month is evidence that this is, that taking uh, a normal day of school, uh, a traditional day of school, and replacing it with a day where my kids, our kids, the community's kids are only going to have, um, you know, I'm talking about, I have one through sixth graders, so that's where I'm thinking of primarily, where they're only going to have a t um, one and a half hours of, of face time with their, their teachers. Where's the evidence that that's, um, that's gonna be good for our kids and our families? That, that's something I'd like to, um, as a homework assignment, I guess, come back with that in August and tell us, tell me why, um, why this is gonna be a positive for our, the, the, the product that we provide to our, our community. Yeah, I'm, I'm not dishing out any homework assignments, but I guess you may be... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, um, I don't mean to be... Uh, the, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm only teacher. kidding. Uh, maybe just kind of share the thought that went into how you arrived at that 1.5 for 1 through 6, and what is it, 30 for pre-K and 45 for K? Sure, so what you're referring to is the minimum amount of synchronous right. time that we've placed into the plan, and that really... That really, some of that is actually modeled off of the way the original remote learning plans were written. Now, what we found is that generally speaking, especially as time went on, those minimums were, were greatly exceeded by the vast majority of our teachers and the way they structured their e-learning days. I think part of that, that synchronous time is the idea that it is going to be that one moment and we won't necessarily have, have, have built up the stamina for some of those screen time engagements. And so I think the idea is it wouldn't be a 90 minute burst and then a bunch of independent 
independent activity. It would allow for some some check in and check and not, not check out, but check in and work independently kinds of things, or work with the support of the people at home. I and mean, we are we have to acknowledge that you know the the students who will need some support are supervised by someone at those times, and so it depends on what that environment would be in terms of what that level of support would be. But I think the idea was to begin with that minimum expectation of at the very least we're going to be live synchronously for that 90 minutes and likely it's going to go a little bit beyond that and we really did go back and forth with how do we set that language without you know without prescribing a very specific schedule for each teacher because what we did learn through the remote learning experiences was that the the autonomy of teachers to build the schedule in the way that would meet the needs of their students was really one of the driving factors in the success of those days and so that's what that's where we're, we're coming from with that and, and whether that you know whether that minimum you know again I think the thing to remember there is that's this is the template plan that goes to ISBE as we develop the actual implementation steps and what it will look like with our teachers we may get some feedback that staff would prefer actually to, to structure it a little bit more and to, and to have that and so those are those will be conversations that we would be able to have with groups of staff once teachers are, are back in full come late August and September yeah just a further tie into what Greg mentioned you know I, I think we we're valuing flexibility a little bit too much uh, you know, at face value of, of this plan. I, I think, you know, if we look at that 1.5 or whatever as, as a um, quality characteristic, I think that's very important from a parent perspective. You know, that 1.5, um, I think the knee-jerk reaction I had personally as a parent was that that seems low. Um, so I just wanted to kind of provide that feedback. No, that's, that's I appreciate that. Thanks. That was a point I was going to mention as well, just as a question, you, you talked about how um, this plan is sort of modeled after the remote experience that we had this past fall which I think a lot of people felt was very good especially compared to what we had initially started off with in the very beginning of the pandemic and there was a lot of improvement and learning that we did to get to that point and that the the remote experience in the fall had a lot of strength to it and so I appreciated that you said oh this is going to be very similar because I was like oh good okay I, I like the sound of that but I also agreed that when I saw the 90 minutes I felt like in the fall there was at least from my own experience with my own kids there was more than 90 minutes of synchronous time um, happening in my house in the fall, and I would like to see more than 90 minutes as part of the plan as well. I do think that having this as an, a potential option um, is good, and I, I like what you put together, but I would like to see more than that 90 minutes. I think most parents found that that synchronous time was the most valuable time, and, and um, so Obviously, if that's a minimum, and we did see many teachers go over that, but perhaps increasing that for the minimum would be beneficial from my point of view as well. But I do really think that what you come up with is good, and I do support a lot of the rationale behind having this as sort of a tool in the toolbox. So I appreciate the work. Thanks. I would piggyback on what Emily said. It wasn't expressly written in here, but it was my understanding when we talked about it at O'Neill. Um, if I remember correctly, I have a middle schooler, so my experience this past year is, was a little different than everyone else, but it was my understanding that the teachers and the administration knocked it out of the park with it, uh, with the remote plan, um, so much so that when we started to talk about going back, they missed the, <laughs> the, the old way that it was with the touch base, like they were literally engaged from 8.30 till 2.30. So in reading these sli the slides before coming tonight, it didn't, that's not what I, that's not what I got out of this. And so if that is what your intention is, it's not expressly in this presentation or in these slides. So I just, I just, I guess that that was something that caught me off guard seeing it like that because it was not my impression from the parents that, that it was 90 minutes of time during the day that they were really just with the teacher then. So the, the, written structure at that point in time was to accomplish the five o'clock hours it was literally two and a half synchronous two and a half asynchronous now again with teacher autonomy there was some increase in synchronous or some different groupings in some cases but it was definitely you're, you're correct the minimum at that time was more of half of that five instructional clock hours and that's certainly something we can like i said that we can continue to talk about i think the other again the, that's just one of the other realities of recognizing that when we were building a long-term plan it has, you know, you, we, we think about it in one way. I, I don't want to make it sound like we would be dismissing that short-term plan, but when I think about a first grader and how much of that focused remote learning time, it took us a while to build up to that 
two and a half hours being truly valuable as opposed to being uh, you know time that we were that we were kind of working through some management things and so I think that's one of the considerations we just want to think through is what kinds of activities will be the most valuable on one of these days that that wouldn't necessarily come again and and again that's where you know the idea of flexibility is yes this it, 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 in my opinion it give, it's a it's a smart thing for us to have this accessible to us but I think it's you know it's also about thinking about the different kinds of emergency situations that could come into play. I think when you're talking about singleton emergency days, that's one conversation. But we, in the past six, seven years, we've lived through a number of years where we've had four and four and up to five of the emergency days that we've had to use. And at that point, I think that's, that's where it comes into play is, is it more valuable to simply stack all of that to the end of the year and recognize that we're now talking about a two or three day gap in learning where we're gonna have a, a, a four day week and a two day week, or can we gain more from that continuity in that particular situation and then again having the plan in place and I and I appreciate the feedback on ensuring that that synchronous time is aligned with what we would hope to see in that moment. The other question I had was um, for middle school students Fallon, why what does modified times mean what would be the I mean they just they were able to do remote this past year when they had to and my son followed the regular schedule and it why is why is it modified times what does that mean? So it would essentially be shortening the periods, which is exactly what we did this year. So a, a middle school period on, on a Tuesday next school year is 47 minutes long for the remote learning periods. And oh, when they the course 30 year, minutes. We did 30 or 35 minutes. So it would, okay. simply, it would simply be shortening it up a little bit. So again, with, with the idea of that, you know, that remote stamina that we wouldn't necessarily have in the same way. But it, okay. wouldn't, it wouldn't be... It would, it would be just proportionally decreasing, kind of similar to what the, the Mondays look like, actually, in terms of length of period. Yeah, and, I, and I want to jump in, too, in terms of the, the time. Certainly, Tracy, I think you, you made a good point when you said, you know, having students engaged all day. That, that is certainly the driver of any one of these plans. I, I do recognize when you read synchronous versus, not, I, I can understand why people would draw that um, conclusion. The other thing that we based a lot of these times off of, and again, to Justin's point, these are initial conversations. That's why we bring it back for feedback and make adjustments. We did a great deal of surveying. We did a great deal of talking to the kids about stamina on Zoom and, and how long you can you know, last on those meetings and, and what's the most uh, efficient and beneficial thing for our students. And so that's where we arrived at a lot of these times were feedback that, that we drew from previous surveys and talking with our, our, our kiddos. So I didn't have an elementary school kid, and not to get into like how the sausage gets made, but how, how did did it did did it morph into what ended up being the day where there was oh you're going to meet with your teacher and we're going to do this lesson and then you're going to go work on it and then you're going like that was the whole part that all the parents were talking about that it wasn't like okay we're going to talk at you for 90 minutes and then go do worksheets or whatever so it was like it looked like from what I heard it looked like a regular day. Mm -hmm. but well, remotely. And, and to some degree it would. I think yes, it, 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 as teachers develop the schedules and organize the days differently, each teacher's um, you know, remote learning day, just like each teacher's in-class day, began to take on its own character. And so while a student may have a total of 90 minutes, let's say, of synchronous time, if you think about the way that looks when we're in person, teachers are moving from group to group, there's small group instruction happening, and so you may not actually have, you know, in a two and a half hour period, you may only have 90 minutes of, of direct teacher face time, but you're, be, you're being given guided activities and practice activities, and when you structure the remote day, that can happen too, where the students can work in smaller groups and check back in, or even just go into a breakout room or, or, or you know, be, turn their screens and cameras off for 20 minutes and come back on. And so that's the piece we have to consider, too. It, it, it's very possible, and in many cases it was true, that the teacher's Zoom link never went off. But the students were instructed to work independently for a period of the time so the teachers could work with different groups. And so the student experience may have been a slightly less amount of synchronous time than the teacher was actually providing across the board of the entire class. Don't mistake my question. Like Greg, you weren't at the last meeting, but I, I use the analogy. Uh, my my daughter my daughter got out at North May twentieth, and my son got out June eleventh, and that felt like an eternity. So um, I I appreciate having this in the tool belt, if you will, um, because at the end it it's pretty brutal for a family who wants to get going and start their summer and so on. And granted, I have an older I have an elementary I mean I have a middle school student, but um, I'm happy that we're going through this process of talking it out. I guess I would just like everyone else is kind of challenging to, to push the envelope a little bit and make it a more robust mm -hmm. for the tool belt. Thanks. Okay. Yeah.
So for me, I think uh, ultimately when I, when I look at this, um, When we look at these plans, I know we kind of reference back to the start of the year, but these, this model actually references more what we looked like at the end of the 1920 school year with a very short amount of synchronous time and a longer amount of asynchronous time. And I don't know that anyone's clamoring to get back there. And where that has a lot of parallels to me is that there wasn't preparation for that. We did well in the fall because we had a two and a half hour split and a two and a half hour split. They did, they bounced back and forth. There was lesson plans developed around there. Uh, I don't see how, even if we have a two or three days in a row, how, how we have enough time to scramble to build an online lesson um, two or three years from now when we're sort of separated from this. I, I think I, I'm concerned is we haven't seen this done in elementary or middle schools yet. I haven't seen it done well in a high school yet. I've seen it done in high schools and I've, I've seen it not go over very well um, in general. So I guess my thought process on this is why is a day where we have an hour and a half of time where the kids have time with their teacher and then three and a half hours where they're disconnected from their teacher, working on a pro focused but, but still separated, why is that better than having a full day of school uh, and just wait? And why would and the other, the other question I have is, we're talking about continuity, and oh, we might have th three days where we miss our continuity, but if we do this, you're saying that we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to necessarily stay in, in a contiguous kind of process anyway, that we may have to pluck out other lessons from somewhere in the curriculum that may make it harder for us to circle back, and now we're revisiting, you know, I don't see how we don't lose time on this, where if we tack on to the end of the year, um, we have a full day of school, ultimately, where our kids get the experience that, quite honestly, we've been sitting up here for the last year fighting so desperately to get back to. Um, so I guess I don't understand the urgency of this uh, right now. We had talked about it a couple of years ago. It was DOA at that point. It never came to a vote or anything. They were just kind of like, wait, why would we do that? Um, I know that other school districts are taking action. I just don't see any urgency to take this action and why wouldn't we wait to see who does it well and who doesn't do it well so and any feedback and I'm, I'm looking for the why as well Darren and I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to sit here in this room and, and listen to this conversation um, again I need to see that why um, right now I, I have flexibility um, I have that two-day gaps are the, the interruption of education of instruction are a problem due date but those you know, I was a classroom teacher for 14 years. I think we had a two-day gap twice that I can remember. Once was for Snowmageddon, which was in 2011, and then the uh, polar vortex, which was <laughs> in uh, 2018 into 2019. Um, and trust me, I remember my, every single one of my snow days because I, as a teacher, I love snow days. Um, <laughs> and you know, the, like uh, Tracy brings up the good point for for parents and families to have that gap in between um, your 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 North students ending in, on May 20th and your or your, your 99th students ending on May 20th and your 50th students ending three weeks later. Um, I, I, um, I, I have a number of problems I'm, that I'm taking notes. I'm just going to um, list them right now. Um, I don't like the idea of my kids spending valuable classroom time practicing remote learning. I don't think that's a good use of instructional time. Um, you know, in September, October, November, when we have no threat of a snow day, I don't think any of their time, you know, maybe they won't do it then, but like, I don't think it's a good use of their time to say, okay, it's, it's winter now, we need to start practicing for remote learning. I don't think that's uh, worth my kids' while. Um, I don't like packets. Um, to me, that just, I, I, I know that can be used effectively to um, bridge the gap in between a day, but to me, there's, just the idea of just sending home a packet at the beginning of the year and saying we might use this at some time um, in February, to me that just, that, that, sorry, that sounds like busy work. Um, I think it's, what I said now, a lot of stuff I said last summer, I think it's developmentally inappropriate to put a kindergartner, first grader, second grader, child with significant needs uh, in front of a, uh, a Chromebook or an iPad and say you have three and a half hours to, to um, you know, work more or less independently. I know Justin, you said that um, they're gonna, that they're gonna work with the support of the people at home, I think that creates an equity. Um, at my home, they have two college-educated parents uh, who have the flexibility to work from home when they need to. My wife always works from home. She hasn't gone to an office in years. Not even before um, COVID did she go into an office. Um, some people don't have that those luxuries. Um, they so I I'll, you know that, that I just I'll leave it there. Um, we. 
like I said, I'm just going to bring it up again. Justin, you said that students with the most significant needs benefit the most significantly from being on site. Um, so they should be on site in June. If, if uh, it's, it's better than having an hour and a half with a, a teacher in, in January. A um, couple other things. Um, we talked about how you know, we, it took us a long time to build up, as Krat used to say, to build up that muscle to get that uh, two and a half hours of, of synchronous work to be truly valuable. Um, that's not going to happen on a one-off day or a two-off day in February. And uh, again, I, I asked the question, where's the evidence that this works well? Um, and I'll just remind everybody that we have a lot of anecdotal evidence from our, our families that this didn't work well for their kids. And they had uh, months of it, and so they had that, that opportunity to, to get good at it. And we did get good at it the best that we could, but I don't, think, I don't see how uh, a few years from now, when we have two days off for another polar vortex, how a kid who's in first grade who never went through remote learning is going to be able to find this uh, beneficial, meaningful, productive time. So if I could, just to be fair, I think we also have anecdotal evidence that states that there were a lot of families who appreciated and saw great sure, benefit. Sure, of course they did. But if you, have, if you have half the families, if it's 50-50, if it's half the families who say, this isn't good for my kid, then you, that's, I mean, it's either good for everybody or it's good for nobody. I mean, we, 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 are, we have to think of all of our students. And if, if we have an, an option between a one day in February where half the kids are going to, you know, my nephew is going to play video games when his mom's not looking. He's not, he's not a 58 student, but I, just, I remember hearing stories about him. Um, and my, kid, 58 student. my kids who are angels <laughs> are, are going to be doing everything that their mom tells them to do because they're little angels. Um, but then you have, that, but you have some kids who just doesn't work for. Why don't we just have everybody in school in, in June, where it just well, works for everybody to the best to, uh, that we know that, that that's going to maximize our opportunities with our kids. I, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, after you. please. I was just going to make a point. I agree with some of what you said, but I want to push back a little bit. And this was something that Justin said in his presentation about um, some of our uh, media students, if you want to. That's not exactly the right word, but whether it is special education students, whether it is um, students who maybe don't have their parents at home with them to help them during the school day, whatever the case may be, while yes, there are additional challenges to them working at home versus working at school. Having a day where, like let's say there is a, a, a snow day, we cannot have school. It's impossible, we're, clo we're not having school, so we're calling the snow day, we're gonna put the day in June. If you have two or three of those in a row, and I'll speak from my own experience, I guess personally, more so than anything else, as a special education parent, um, that would be horrible for my children. Oh, so they would, even if, if it's a choice between saying they get 90 minutes of synchronous time where they can see their teacher's face, see their classmate's face, socialize, have some structure and some routine, because my, my kid would be the kid who would be playing video games when I'm not looking 100%. For sure. I would be um, too. So <laughs> yeah. uh, in that structure would be 100 times preferred for me than putting a day in June because that would be better for them academically, emotionally, mentally than three days in a row off or even one day in, even one day without school. My son was one of the kids where when we had a snow, he was like crying. I want to go to school. I want to see my teachers. I want to see my friends. Mm -hmm. So. I think yes, there's challenges for some, and I think that might be true as well for some students who maybe don't have a very positive home environment, and the only positivity they get is from their teachers. So they want to see them, even if it's on the computer. They'd rather see them on the computer than not see them at all. So I think that there's two sides to that point. Just from that I, point of view, I agree with you. And if there was some, I was looking for some caveat in in the language that says this is reserved for like the most extreme of extreme situations. Um, it said judicious. Like too, huh? Judicious, <laughs> I understand that, but like this is, this one, this, once this genie's out of the bottle, it's never going back in. Um, and this board of education is not gonna be around here forever, except for Darren, who's gonna um, be here, <laughs> gonna be buried with his gavel we were talking about before the meeting. And we will never let Kevin retire, of course, <laughs> but you know, eventually they'll both, they'll both be gone. Um, so uh, if there was, you know, if, if it was you know, in, in writing, this is reserved for those longer gaps. But I mean, like, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I agree with you. Like, I, I know families who I talk to who, um, you know, like they have, their students have some pretty significant um, needs and situations, and remote learning was very hard for them. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no ideal, there's no quick fix. But I mean, like, those kids who, like, need, want to see their teachers, they're going to get their, their days 
we yeah, but they're going to get three days off with nothing in between, or even if it's one day with nothing. For some, for some kids, that's that's hard. I understand. Yeah, they'll yeah, get the day at the end. Week. Like they'll they'll get the day at the end, but that's different. Yes, they'll get the educational content at the end, but they won't get everything else they get, which there's a lot, especially for special education students. It's all, educational stuff is almost like the secondary part. I mean, for my own child, that's 100 percent true. The yeah, academics is secondary. That's not what he needs the most from his teacher. So, can just, there's Justin just, there's was going to say something, and then we didn't let him go ahead. No, Justin. <laughs> not at all. No, I, I think I, I think one of the conversations coming up is is to get a little more into what is what is the value and uh, of using a day like this, and and we can certainly build that out a little bit more as we come back next month. But obviously, if we were to move forward next month, that'll be the moment. So the other thing I would just suggest is that the comparison, you know, there is some overall stamina and and reality of the more days we add out in June we already go pretty late and we structure the year that way in in some part because we are mostly not air conditioned and so you certainly have also heard feedback about when the heat kicks up and what that learning environment becomes and I don't want to dismiss those days currently because I think everyone does their level best to make sure that all of that learning is happening but the extension of the year at some point as all of the other summer based activities begin happening for families there there can be a bit of diminishing return in terms of the ability of, of families to focus on homework and projects and things after school when all of those other activities that are typically beginning in June start to take place. And so it's not necessarily a question of whether we can maintain the learning environment. It's a question of shifting into what actually feels like summer in the community where we are already one of the latest school districts in session. So it's just another piece to, to consider as we think about valuing. I, I don't know that it's an apples to apples comparison that day in, in February versus that day in June, just like it's not an apples to apples comparison comparison about an e-learning day versus versus a day of, of full instruction. I think it's just all, we have to kind of weigh it all and think about that. And that's the kind of decision making we would want to use if we were to enact it. But I think the, the, the point <coughs> of all of it is the, the lack of a plan prohibits us from even having that conversation or that possibility at any point during the school year. And that's really, that will be the question bef before the board is do we want to have that as a possibility with Kevin's understanding of what the board expectations are for usage or do we want to to pass on that for the school year? And so for me, that's a no. And, I, and, and I, that we, I'd want to pass on it and I'll tell you why. You, everything you brought up is absolutely true about punting at the end of the year and someday we might be able to fix that if we can get some of our buildings air conditioning we can shift up our day that there could be a long-term goal on that but here's what I have what moving days into June is a known entity we've been working with that forever um, and now we're talking about fundamentally changing the way that we handle these days I've yet to see this successfully executed even really fully at a, at a high school level and, and Fine, I'd be, I'd be great to look at some examples, but what I need to see is where has this been successful in K through six? I think our seventh and eighth graders have the highest chance of finding success in this day, though I don't see how that becomes more successful of a day uh, for our seventh and eighth graders than it is now. I, we look, I think the conversation is happening right now because we feel like we got our sea legs from doing e-learning, but I a year, I think six months from now, those sea legs are going to be gone. We're not going to be able to turn it on in a, in a single day moment. And I don't see this executing as a good day of learning for my kid and I, or any child in, in this district. And I have kids like Greg's that somebody will be home. They'll be able to execute. We'll create a, an ideal environment for them to work. But I know that that's not true for everybody. And I know what our known entity is. I would love to see first success stories. And then if people are knocking out of the park, come back to us and say, man, uh, Woodridge implemented this and look at how it's working. It's great. Wouldn't it be great for us to have this? For me, flexibility, the only, the only thing we're being flexible on is if we, if we use a day at the end of the year or it's not. And having a fixed day to the end of the school year is less important to me than the, the education that we're delivering. This is not impeding the work that we've done on e-learning. I just don't have faith that that's what's in the best interest of young learners. And that's why, that's why I have to be a no on this. I think when, when this came up a couple of years ago, it was dead on arrival because we were looking at it from a kindergartner, first, second, third grader. Um, I think I'd have a completely different attitude if I was sitting on the board of District 99. Um, I also think that we're remembering what it looked like at the beginning of this year. And I, if ultimately our goal is to be much higher than an hour and a half and a half an hour for kindergarten and stuff like that, that's not what's in, what, what's in this plan. And 
and you and, and Dr. Russell may have a plan that you want to execute and, and make that a much stronger process, but I can see that diminishing over time if it's not maintained and, and d don't have the same level of leadership a few years from now. And so opening up a tool just to have it when, when I don't know that it works well is, I don't see the urgency, and I, I think that that's why I, I've been a no on this and why uh, I took some time to, I, I called Dr. Russell, I, I went through the plan, um, but it, it's why I was against it last month and, and why I'm, I'm going to have to remain against it at this point. What I, I think would be interesting is, is maybe I'm wrong, and so if, if that's the case, uh, if, if we, if I don't know if anyone surveyed parents on this and said, hey, this is a model, would you like to have this instead of days in June? Um, may, maybe I'm out of touch, but I got to tell you, the families that I've been speaking with, I feel like I'm, I'm representing well here today. So. Sure. So I have a comment. We can point counterpoint for hours on this matter, just like always, right? There's always going to be one family that's going to do well, one that's not going to do well. I think there's some very solid facts here, right? One is that this is a three-year term of the plan. After three years, it comes back again for reapplication, correct? Correct. So that just is what it is. It's not an in perpetuity. This is a tool in the tool belt. Best opportunity to see that this works for our students is now. However, two, we're talking from a perspective, 15 days over three years, should every single one of those days be used as an e-learning day? And should we have five emergency days per year over that course of time? Data tells me that typically we're two or three days in a year that are emergency days. And what I'm hearing is, is that it's not always going to be called a e-learning day, right? That's going to be utilized in certain circumstances where, from what your words were, a traditional snow day wouldn't necessarily be in existence, right? Over the course of my watching the board for years now, um, I've seen time and again a lot of trust put in the administration and a lot of trust put in the recommendations by staff, and I think in this instance, I go the same route. They know what they're doing. They're familiar with the curriculum. They know how best to serve the students. They know how to implement these things. If anything has shown us that, it's been over the last two years. So I would stick with my comments from last month. They stay the same. I would echo Melissa's comments. Um, this is a tool in the toolkit. Uh, and I, I, I'm not going off of, we, have, we feel like we have our, I think Darren Jeer words, we have our sea legs under us. This is a, um, we were caught flat footed during a emergency situation in the last year. This is an opportunity for us to have plans in place for the solution that's in search of a problem that we don't know, definition of an emergency, right? We don't know what the reasons are going to be in future years for why we would be put in a situation where e-learning might be a tool we wish we had. What I, I think as a board, we have uh, hundreds of policies in our policy manual, many of which we hope never get used. But it's a tool in our toolkit in case the emergency happens, in case a situation happens. What we're voting on, or what we, uh, what, uh, so I would be a yes vote on moving forward with a plan because a school district that doesn't have a plan isn't doing its job as a school district. Uh, the state is giving us a, a, a chance here to say, present your plan, we'll vet it. If we approve it, you have it as a tool in your toolkit. Then it's a question of do you trust your administration to use it when it's appropriate. I'm not the judge for when it's appropriate, but what I am the judge of is making sure that our administration that we've hired, we've trusted, we've um, uh, uh, continued to put faith in, have the tools in their toolkit. Uh, I think it'd be silly of us to think in Ju July of 2021 that we know what's coming, coming out of a pandemic year that's not over yet, by the way. Uh, so let's not act like we know what's coming up, but let's act like we know what we're doing right now, which is to give our uh, administration the tools that they need. Two things I just want to say. One, um, not adding this as a, a tool as part of our plan is not not having a plan. Our plan would, is the same plan we've always had and it's the way that we handle emergency days. This has nothing to do with long-term remote learning. This is an emergency plan 
that would go into effect if we have a single or a couple of days, but would not be a long-term impact. I think it would be short-sighted of us to not continue to learn from this pandemic and make sure that we have a long-term understanding. So should anything ever go, and we had to shut down for a long period of time, how we could use technology and how we could use learning, and I think that those would be vastly different than how we would use them in one-offs. I think that, that that working knowledge would have to continue to be built and have a plan, but that these days are not what got used during a pandemic and would not be what got used in a pandemic again. This is for, it's really, really cold, it's too dangerous for kids to be at a, a bus stop, there was too much snow, we can't physically get to the building on a one-off basis, and to me this doesn't remotely look like what it did in, um, in the pandemic, and that doesn't mean we're not learning for that. This is a specific thing. So not voting on this is not having a plan. We've had a plan for decades. My question is, why now when we've never seen a situation where it worked? And, um, and so I value, I value getting the level of education that I know works now and letting someone else be a guinea pig. And if I skip, look, I'll be the first one in, in June voting for this if, if other people are knocking it out of the park. And I'm like, man, if we don't have to be in school and we can have a, a, a solid end date, but the only flexibility part that I'm hearing about this is that we get to know when the end of the school year is, that isn't compelling enough to me. But um, I think there are other opportunities to lead here besides waiting for somebody else to show us how good it looks. Uh, I would put our response to the pandemic up against any other district in the, in the country, to be perfectly honest. I think we knocked it out of the park and nothing looks great during a pandemic. Uh, I'm not looking for other districts to show us what good looks like because I trust that we've hired the best of the best. Uh, what good looks like is knowing what tools you have in the toolkit and knowing when to use them. So if, imagine we're in December and for some reason other than snow, we cannot use our buildings for that, for that week. But weather's fine, whatever else might be the situation is the situation, but for some reason we can't use our buildings. We no longer have a way to educate our students because they can't come into the buildings. We, the emergencies are the emergencies by definition that we can't predict what it would be that we would be using it for. For us to say, look back and say, well, we wish we had put in place this plan that other districts around us are now enacting allows us to not be in a leadership position because we can show where we are and how we're choosing to be judicious on enacting those plans. All we're saying here is give them the tools, not saying we can be, Kevin doesn't make decisions without consulting almost all of us on the board, at a minimum consulting Darren uh, on, on, on many decisions. Uh, we can be a board that says judicious means uh, like extreme situations. Judicious means five consecutive snow days. Judicious could be a, a lot of different things that we set the tone on as a board. All we're saying with this plan is have it in your toolkit. Have it in our toolkit. That's all we're saying right now. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. I'm just saying it's not a tool that I'd want to use, so therefore I would want to put it in the toolkit. Um, you know, but, so but that's Darren, my what, what you're suggesting is that you know all the situations by which you would want to enact a tool that is by definition for emergency use. Can I'm you predict I have all the emergencies? That works. And I'm saying I can't see a situation right now where right. this is bad. I understand that you so can't see the I situation. I don't see urgency in, in July of, tw of 2021 right now in why I need to make a fundamental shift to the way that we provide emergency education to our students. This, is a, this isn't just adding a tool to the toolbox. This is a fundamental shift in the way that we handle emergency days. It's fine if we end up passing it, and, and I'm not saying that we won't find a way to make it work. I just don't think it's better, and I don't think it's in the, in the best interest of our students. I'm not saying it can never be. I just don't see a plan here. An hour and a half of uh, FaceTime with my kid's teacher is not the experience that I want for my student on emergency day. Um, but I, th I feel like we're going in circles and I think the... We're not voting on it tonight. We're not anyway, voting so. on it tonight. So I think the best step is to, to come discussion. up with the final uh, proposal uh, to us on, uh, on in August and it'll go up for public hearing, uh, very similar to the way that we do uh, our, our budget and then um, and we'll have an opportunity uh, to hear from from the public as well thank, thank you, you Justin. thank you thank, thank you Justin. thanks Justin. Thanks, Justin. <coughs> all right this now leads us to public comment this is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board 
Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you please keep your comment to a three minute limit to allow everybody the opportunity to speak. At this time, I have three cards. So first up, uh, I have Joe Leo. Thank you, good evening. And good evening. Uh, uh, you know why I'm here talking about Longfellow. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, your discussion here, this may be way out of the box. Why can't you have both? Have some e-learning for the emergency days that keeps the continuity, provides contact for all kids, but then have the makeup days. Now, I may be oversimplifying it, and I don't know how the teacher contract would work with all that. <laughs> Jane, I know you used it. <laughs> but, but it, it'd almost be like having your cake and eat it too. So you could really, you could get both sides. So anyway, all right, I digress. Anyway, Longfellow, um, just a couple things that I, I didn't hear addressed tonight. Um, the village, as you guys probably all saw, has reinitiated their plan to put together this village hall and in the paper article I saw they talked about the opportunity for the I believe it was the police department and school district 58 to be part of that program um, so I'm I'm kind of curious as to if this is something you guys are going to explore I think you should um, and you know Todd could put together the numbers on how that might work um, you know granted it might be a two, three year wait until that building is ready, but looking at the numbers that Todd presented, you know, it's $120,000, $140,000 a year to, you know, to stay in Longfellow with, you know, potential for extra if some of those other things happen. But that would give you the opportunity to continue exploring the opportunity with the village because I know the one time that was something you guys were very serious about so I don't know I, th I think you should look at that and, and talk about it in your your next meeting um, number two uh, I did I, I've, I've been seeing a lot about the corona um, funds that are starting to come out and was curious I couldn't find it on the website anyway I don't know if it's been posted yet do we know how much we will be getting uh, from this because as Todd explained we, we've got a win you know uh, we had a little bit of a windfall this year because of the, uh, the, the one extra fund that you received and then the lower transportation costs and if we're going to get some extra money you know maybe that is part of our solution for next year's summer work so then that gives you that opportunity to look longer at this village option um, and then lastly it, it's part of your closed session tonight, but the wording was very vague. I couldn't quite understand what it was, and I understand it's closed session, but if, there, if you could provide some transparency on what the one item meaning leasing or acquiring real property, is, is that related to the Longfellow thing? Is it about an office lease, or, or you just can't say? No. I know there, there isn't dialogue. Is there any level of clarity we can provide? Uh, it, yeah, in, in closed session, it, it's a general legal term in terms of why you can go into closed session. Right. Um, the Board of Education can talk about uh, leasing potential properties in closed session without disclosing those to the public okay. while you're still negotiating. Okay. Got it. All right. Yeah. Thank does you. Does that clarify, Joe? Yes. It does. Okay. Yeah. Thank and, you. and if the about the the Corona money, if someone can communicate. That yeah, I, I think what uh, that might be. I can have Todd follow up with you over the next week or so. Will All that right. work, Todd? Yeah, quicker yeah. too. Yeah, I'll we'll make sure we get that. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Marshall Schmidt, Longfellow. So I want to pick up on uh, where Joe uh, left off, and what Joe's discussion highlights is that two significant things have changed since you guys voted on the resolution. One is you didn't get a qualifying bid, so obviously something in the process failed and you now are confronted with a situation that you have increased uncertainty. You don't know what that property is worth. What we heard today was a, kind of a long, all over discussion about, well, maybe it was the asbestos, maybe it was the six months, maybe it was this. When you're in a situation like this and things change, and the second thing, by the way, that changed was the village council is now looking at taking these extra funds 
uh, from both this organization, this, this institution, and what they're receiving and building a facility where you could house your staff. And that might be your best possible solution. And it might be your best possible solution while keeping Longfellow. Uh, Mr. Drayfall admitted that there was no hard number for what the asbestos remediation was, which points out what we were discussing through this process, which is that the process by which you've evaluated your different options is, has been flawed. You've not engaged the public. You now have an opportunity. You now have an opportunity to engage both those people who you know, are, are buying into what you're saying as well as the people who are opposed to what you're saying, okay, what you've decided to do. But based on what's on the agenda and what Mr. Drayfall is recommending, you're just proceeding blindly, whereas two very important things have changed and you have uncertainty that you have not accounted for. And what's clear in this process is that you did not account for the contingency that you wouldn't get your 3.8 million. And now you're left with, well, maybe it was this, maybe it was that, we don't really know. What you need to do is take a step back. There's nothing, there's no pressing need for you in August to decide to continue on the path that you've chosen to go on. Things have changed, you need to step back, and you need to take a breath, and you need to look at what your options are, what the finances look like, and then go forward and make the best possible decision. And it may very well be that building a facility, waiting three years, because the other advantage of waiting three years and making do with what you have now for your staffing is it's an opportunity to engage the public in a solution that is beneficial to all concerned, okay? And that would provide the community an opportunity to figure out how to preserve Longfellow, even if you choose ultimately to sell it. So, all I'm asking you to do is to take a look at what's changed, reevaluate where you are, and most of all, have a plan because now you're bidding against yourself. If you say the price is $3 million and the party who bid is going to bid, bid $2.8, you're bidding against yourself. So take a breath and think it over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got one more card at David Rose. I pointed out in my first comment on the subject that Downers Grove is a town that believes in low taxes, which sadly means it believes in hidden taxes to be paid when deferred maintenance and projects can no longer be put off. By my assessment, the even sadder reality is that deferring maintenance has been the prevailing attitude across the nation for decades. We are about to find out the hard way what that means. Hard decisions lie ahead. In Downers Grove, a major impediment to making good choices when faced with hard decisions is the relative isolation of the discussion and planning done by its individual taxing bodies. At present, Downers Grove has no mechanism for regular coordination and discussion across taxing bodies, one that allows for regular public input and exchange. Thus, I believe, as has been stated, the interest of public and relevant taxing bodies had insufficient opportunity to discuss how to repurpose and enhance Longfellow as a public resource prior to your decision to try to sell it. The pandemic, of course, did not make such discussion any easier. Selling Longfellow in order to raise a bit of money comports with the current standard practice in the village of seeing economic development as the universal solution to every taxing body's past failure to tax adequately. But we must begin to recognize that relentlessly pursuing growth is in fact a dog chasing its tail. In that vein, I'll say to you what I've said already to both the Village Council and District 99. The way of life in Downers Grove is not environmentally sustainable, which means it's not financially sustainable unless the village persists in foisting the burden and costs of its unsustainable way of living onto others, the less powerful living outside the village. I bring this up for two reasons. First, it means economic development is not a systemic solution over the long term, even when it seems to be a local solution in the short term for an individual entity such as Downers Grove. This disorienting fact underlies the many hard decisions ahead. 
Second, for the entirety of their adult lives, the children of District 58 and the children everywhere are going to face the difficult task of trying to figure out how to live environmentally sustainably. That task falls to them because we adults have failed to act soon enough, quickly enough, and boldly enough. Not living environmentally sustainably is the ultimate deferred maintenance problem. Thus, rather than see Longfellow's problem, I believe we should see it as a timely and opportune beginning for a much needed course correction in Dowdage Grove. I personally hope residents want to begin living in an environmentally sustainable manner. I further hope they will see repurposing Longfellow as a public resource dedicated to teaching, researching, and learning about environmental sustainability as the perfect foundation upon which to undertake that mission. District 58, please take the opportunity now open to you and to the village for us to reimagine what Longfellow can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. We are we still have some time left on our 30 minute clock. Is there anyone else that wishes to make a public comment this evening? Thank you. All right, next up is the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the June 14th, 2021 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Abstain. Member Olchek. Abstain. And Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the minutes from the June 14th, 2021 regular meeting as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member <coughs> Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have three items up for action tonight. Uh, the first one is the social studies curriculum resource adoption for grades six through eight. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of the National Geographic Learning published by Sengig Learning in the quantities defined in the attached quote for the total cost of $310,028.46? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Thank you so much. <laughs> this is a long time coming before I was even on the board and sat on the curriculum council. The social studies teachers that were on there were like giving up their passion to let math go first. And so the fact that this has finally come to pass is like fantastic. So, and I'm so glad that they took that second look to, because if I remember correctly, this wasn't the one that they piloted first. There was two that they piloted and then they said, you know, let's go pilot one more and they went with that third one. So that just shows you the process works and so I'm super thrilled that this is happening for the middle school. So. And just to piggyback off of that, um, to show how long it's been since we've had a social studies curricular adoption. <laughs> yeah, what was the year? I was on the previous social studies <laughs> curriculum and I think I presented to Joe and Marshall at, at Longfellow a very, very long time ago and so it is uh, much needed and um, I do agree with you, Tracy, there, there were solid reasons why it was pushed back but, you know, social studies has changed a great deal since 2006, uh, <laughs> back when we were on there and um, it is certainly time. I want to. Uh, also piggyback up with something else you said i want to commend um justin and the curriculum council instead of making uh you know that, that quick decision well this is good enough they didn't do that and, and they went back and they continue to work and press each other to, to make sure that we're getting this right and so thank you and in a very strange year on top of it so absolutely thank you <laughs> anything else i mirror exactly the same thing thanks so much for taking the time and to all who worked on it out there Here's, here's to not waiting 14 years for another adoption. Yes, yeah. I, I think we can all agree on that. Cheers. 
and I, I, would, I would just push off. all of that credit on to the teachers who yeah. stepped up and were given the choice in August to say, are we going to do this and are we not? And, and K-5, for very good reasons, said let's, let's wait a year, but our 6th through 8th grade teachers, and our 6th through 8th teachers in particular, um, really did a, a tremendous job of making sure that not only did they pilot the materials, but did it with significant fidelity and had really carving out time for conversations and, and meetings in a year when that was not easy to do. So I appreciate the, 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 the kind words, and I just want to be clear that the credit truly goes to the people who are so in the stressful. trenches working through this. It's Christmas in July for them. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good way to think. <laughs> Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of the National Geographic Learning, published by Sengig Learning in the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $310,028.46. I think it's Sengig. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of two Dell PowerEdge R640 servers, a Dell EMC ME4024 storage array, three years of support and configuration of the storage from Sentinel Technologies, Inc. for a total cost of $26,916. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of two Dell PowerEdge R640 servers, a Dell EMC ME4024 storage array, three years of support, and, config and the configuration of the storage from Sentinel Technologies, Inc. for a total cost of $26,916. Last up is a bid for custodial supplies. Is there a motion to award the bid for the 2021-2022 custodial supplies to Warehouse Direct at the prices presented in the attached memo? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchin. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for the 2021 through 2022 custodial supplies to Warehouse Direct at the prices presented in the attached memo. A couple of announcements. We do have uh, some meetings coming up. Friday, August 6th at 7 a.m. will be the Financial Advisory Committee. That'll be over at the ASC. And then Monday, August 9th at 7 p.m. will be the next regular board meeting right here at Village Hall. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to, to, to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the District 5 ILCS 122C1 and uh, just A and E? Oh, I'm sorry, B and E. Uh, the purchase or lease of real estate for the use of the public body, including meetings held for the purpose of discussing whether a particular parcel should be acquired, 5 ILCS 122C5, and discussion of, meet of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval of the body of the minutes or for the semi-annual review of the minutes is mandated by Section 2.06. That's 5 ILCS 122C21. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet up at 837.